Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's edition of the BHS series. Uh, this week, we are in collaboration with ESA Business School. And my name is Yad Mubarak, and I am an associate director at ESA Business School. Um, thank you so much to Barcelona Health Hub for organizing this, uh, for inviting me to moderate. Thank you, Aline Moazet, as well, uh, for inviting me. Um, and uh, this week, we have a very interesting session uh, discussing innovating in healthcare education. Uh, our speakers with us today are uh, Javier Olba, who is a senior health consultant at Elephant Jump. We have Daniela Klapp, uh, the founder and CEO of Xpeer. And we have Magda Rosenmuller, who is an associate professor at ESA Business School. So I'm, I'm very excited to get started. This is a topic that is incredibly relevant today. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start off with a round of introductions. So uh, Javier, maybe uh, you could begin, maybe just let us know uh, a little bit about yourself and um, what was your sort of, um, what is your role concerning this topic and what, what work have you done within this topic, I would say, within innovation in healthcare education? Thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers, especially our lead, to invite me to share my experience. I have been working during more than 20 years in the health industry, in spite of the fact that I look like younger. This is one of the highest advantage of a, of a webinar, of course. I work in a several business position uh, uh, in du during these last 20 years in pharma companies. But in my last eight years, I had the opportunity to work in digital transformation and uh, incorporating innovative strategies to pharma companies. First in a pharma company uh, like Sanofi and in the last three years in my consultant uh, firm. Currently, I'm working with a lot of pharma companies, scientific society, hospitals and health authorities to help them to solve their current challenge with innovative solutions, always through design thinking methodologies and digital tools. For instance, currently I'm working with Novartis in the neurology area to train to neurologists to, to, to become entrepreneurships and develop innovative technologies to solve patient and meet needs in neurologist uh, pathologies. But uh, in the last three months, I'm enjoying a lot because the most of my clients are sure that the digital tools and innovative uh, methodologies are the key skill that they must incorporate in their daily professional activities. I have trained more than seven companies during the last two months to incorporate multi-channel strategies to their promotion. Because maybe currently I'm one of the professionals with a longer experience on remote medical visit, and a lot of companies are interested in incorporating the remote medical visit in their uh, promotional activity. The key ingredient is to adapt the new digital channels to the promotional models. Uh, we are changing the tools, but the objective of the pharma companies continues uh, being the same. And we work not only in the training of these new digital channels or the new, the new digital tools, but also in the sales representative skills. We need that this uh, sales reps representative must practice a lot with these new ch digital channels to use it uh, successfully. And moreover, we are working a lot with the marketing and medical teams because we would like that they adapt or readapt their content strategy to these new channels. Then in the last uh, three months, we have seen a lot of change in the healthcare education promoted by the, the pharma companies. Today, I will try to talk always from the pharma company perspective do the, do, due to the fact that my colleagues can share their view from other perspective. Then I'm going to try to talk always uh, from the pharma perspective. And this is my introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniela, how about you now? Hi, Dia. Uh, thank you so much to Barcelona Health Hub for having this session. I think it's a um, very interesting topic, not only because of the COVID-19 situation, but uh, um, it's uh, a mission we have all to innovate in the way we train physicians. So on my part, uh, all my life dedicated to the to the healthcare education myself. And in the last years, um, I will on my part represent the doctors. Um, so the doctors 
doctors were asking me uh, about training on digital uh, tools and how to handle all this digital innovation in the field and um, also to uh, access easily uh, to education and um, enhance their skills uh, to face the challenges that uh, we are facing uh, right now. So basically, I created last year uh, the app Xpeer. It's a mobile application uh, that is Netflix style. I will try to show you. So really, it's very easy. Uh, it's medical education made easy, and I like to compare it like uh, a Netflix. So it's video based and personalized content. Uh, for the doctors to build personalized itineraries uh, according to their needs. So basically the topic is uh, very uh, interesting right now because uh, in healthcare education, okay, so we have virtual reality simulators, lots, lots, lots of technology, but uh, when um, it's back to basics, uh, I mean doing presentations, for instance, uh, we train the doctors the same way as 20 years ago. And now that we don't have the opportunity to gather into congresses together, uh, things are getting a little bit more more difficult and accelerating a change that was uh, on its way. That's it for me. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Magda. Yes, hi, thanks. thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure and uh, uh, what an honor and a pleasure to talk about something that is very close to our heart at uh, yes and all this is what we what we do myself i'm a, I'm a medical doctor and i like very much daniel what you presented i think when i studied i would have loved to have something like uh, like that and we'll definitely change you know the way that we look into the qualification of of uh, 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 doctors we look into what we do at uh, yes sir. so we are uh teaching you know the mba executives professionals startups so we have a variety of uh, uh, uh different groups that we talk that we teach to it's usually it's management it's change management and then we might be looking into uh, uh innovation management uh but in recent years we have been working a lot on um creating this entrepreneurial spirit in companies, but we have also been working on looking into what do, do doctors need. And we have been working with pharmaceutical companies also, and we have been teaching their clients like medical doctors and QLs. We have been also teaching um, uh, Salesforce. So the, uh, we, we have been looking into how can we make them more creative uh, and more uh, using design thinking, using new ways of, um, of um, innovating. If we can now just pass to the next slide, we have been now COVID. We really, we really took as an opportunity. As yes, yes uh, we have been uh, working with our learning innovation unit on new ways uh, over the last years with our global campus, with uh, having already some virtual with our virtual classroom. That's the one you see here on this uh, uh, on this slide. But I think it was COVID that really pushed us. It's saying. Well, our MBA students would like to finish their MBA. Uh, they still need to do classes. And really, from one day to the next, we moved everything online. I, there was a team at Yesa that in, in, in a week, we had everything online and then we uh, um, refined it. It was really a lot of learning on the go. It was great because it was a real opportunity of saying, well, this is the moment. Students were open to that. They wanted to finish their, their MBA. So everyone was very positive towards that. And I think this was a real, a really fantastic uh, experience. If we move on to the next slide, there's like we are, yes, a part of the Business School Alliance for Health Management. And in our work with them, we kind of discovered now we had an, a, a meeting uh, of uh, the association last week and we said, hey, this is now we can actually we could teach like I could teach in the Miami Business School and I have an, an expert then from Stanford teaching at Yesa, which, by the way, we had already done last week. So there's a lot of different things coming up. And if we move if we move on to 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 the next would be um, one uh, uh, collaboration that is possible now because we are in the virtual world is this great initiative that Harvard Business School students started with the MBAs fight COVID. And I know that CIA has been very much involved in pushing our students on getting some uh, uh, startups uh, um, in, involved. They meet every week. So we have real students helping on real startups all, all over the world. So this is, I think it's a, it's a, a fantastic opportunity that has been possible because it's, it's actually online. And we realized, well, we can 
can do that online, no? If you move, then 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 on um, is this the the uh, another thing that we do is the BAM case competition that probably we will host at Yesa next year because we said, well, we're in a virtual world now we can do. It. Probably we will team up with an with an African school. Uh, let's move on. I, I brought you a few examples. These are just things that we I can share with the audience later of um, how medical education and uh, I think Daniela already gave a, a great example. So this is Take the Wind. I love this company that is based in uh, uh, Coimbra that is using um, simulation. So you can do simulations uh, uh, um, online and, and that's a great way. And if we move to the next, this is uh, uh, Tony Lassi uh, from Hospital Clinic that created the IES channel and he has surgeons from all, all over the world can, can actually watch that. The point here is probably to say that we really see a democratization of access to uh, uh, to um, education, that we can really, uh, 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 in geographical access, but also low 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 income people that can really access uh, uh, um, innovation uh, uh, um, education. Let's pass to to the next. So. Here we have seen the education more the clinical and that can be innovated and uh, Daniela can probably talk about this much better than I. What we did inside EIT Health is looking into what other skills do, do uh, clinicians need. So we did this, uh, 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 the future health managers, so that would be executives and also um, professionals, definitely um, the IT skills, no, the technical skills of using the digital skills is a very important point that was addressed here and that we then have been taken up in different uh, uh, programs. And now, now if we move to the next, just a few examples of uh, innovation, of educative pro, uh, programs under EIT Health, like the MedTech Bootcamp, that where we participate at, at Yes, so we bring people uh, together from, from, from all over Europe to work, uh, to work together. Part of this will be done um, uh, online also to the next where we see this is particularly looking into um, what well, the summer school that is similar that's more to a younger crowd and then the next one particularly looking into the role of, uh, of women like how, how can we um, um, empower women this is on on the rooftop of uh, Yesa and it's nice to see because I haven't been there for well nearly three months now so I'm eager to go to go back I have two more slides, maybe mo moving to the next. That's a very interesting one uh, in the IT health. This is about needs-based innovation here in Barcelona. It's BioCard who is implementing this with their uh, Mobius uh, uh, program that we really, and that's one of the other points I want to make in uh, that education uh, is moving more practical. We really go, do apply things. We do needs, needs, needs based. Uh, uh, we, we teach to them uh, 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 how to do needs, needs based innovation. And this is like younger fellows. And the last slide I have is an example from, from uh, Ireland. Um, that is uh, the the bio uh, the bio innovate that are using this new set innovation also with executives so that uh, with Medtronic for example so I'm just this in a, in a nutshell the variety of things that we that we're doing uh, we need a different workforce that would be my my the one important point we are moving digital and COVID has helped to to uh, uh, this and the third point probably is saying. Well, needs-based education, and I would say fun also, no? to make education fun and to show our people that really that can make a, a, an impact. If they're better educated, they can really do and, and, and to make an impact in the world. And maybe I close here. See, I'd back to you. Thank you, Magda. Thank you, Magda. I think what you illustrated, what, what you've always illustrated is that we have representation here by different stakeholders uh, and uh, all the stakeholders have to play a role. So. Uh, I, you know, Ch uh, Javier, uh, Javier is talking, uh, uh, you know, is representing pharma. We have, um, we have the innovative startup also here uh, with Daniela and then Magda representing uh, universities and everyone's going to be playing this role in education. Uh, and it's so relevant right now, especially in the context of what we're going through. So maybe my question though uh, is the bit in the room and many of you have touched on it already is uh, COVID-19 uh, and how has it uh, sort of disrupted the, um, the status quo? Uh, and here we're talking about a very traditional way of doing business, a tra very traditional way. We lost our moderators. We lost, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> 
We lost the ad. <laughs> we have, we but have I think we get. In, yes, we yeah. can, we, we can continue with the discussion because we have been preparing in, in some minutes uh, ago. And then yeah. uh, the, the second topic that we would like to focus is what about which are the current challenge with COVID-19 uh, for the different perspective. If you want, I can start uh, from the pharma uh, company perspective. Uh, during the last three months, maybe the three big challenges that the pharma companies has had uh, with their uh, relationship with other stakeholders is regarding the first one is, is to try to investigate in uh, new drugs uh, to solve the pathologies, to solve the, 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 the COVID-19. And there are a lot of companies who are uh, investing a lot of money and searching new vaccines for coronavirus. Maybe this is one of the big challenges for the pharma companies. The second big challenge that the pharma companies are investing a lot of time is trying to help uh, the stakeholders like physicians and health authorities to develop solutions to solve uh, the problems uh, related with the pandemic. For instance, there are a lot of companies who are developing new software that make easier the diagnosis of this uh, virus. Or, for instance, there are other companies who are developing a new content for patients uh, or, uh, regarding their pathologies and relationship with this, with this pandemic. But maybe one of the big challenges, and today we are talking about this challenge, is about uh, the educational. Uh, I, I told before that this is one of the big challenges because uh, the, it's maybe one of the, the, the most difficult for, for pharma companies to readapt the, the educational proposal to physicians uh, because the reps that are the, the, the most important active that the pharma company has to, to train physicians is the sales representative. And all of these sales representatives are at home uh, during these last three months. They cannot continue visiting. And uh, the pharma companies at the beginning started to, to, to take the opportunity to have all the sales representatives at home to train them about new skills or, or to train them about how to use these new digital tools. And they uh, did a lot of big efforts to uh, incorporate digital channels to the educational programs. And there are a lot of uh, and a lot of several projects that we can demonstrate that the pharma companies readapt uh, completely the educational programs that they are offering to physicians. But the big challenge regarding the, the educational is when, is what is going to happen in the in the in the coming month because uh, maybe in September we are we will have the opportunity to come back to the visit with the physicians and we didn't know what could happen if we need to maintain the distance with our physicians for that reason it's 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 clear that the everything that we have learned in digital communication in the last uh, month uh, we need to continue doing and we cannot do continue with the with the real uh, presence a uh, visit and we can continue with a mixed model uh, doing educational uh, promotion with uh, remote uh, visits and the other big challenge is what would happen with the Congress, because as you know, the Congress for physicians are maybe one of the most important uh, points where physicians can upload new information, updated information. And maybe uh, in the coming month, they won't have the opportunity to organize Congresses and uh, because we cannot stay a lot of people together. And we will see how the pharma companies can readapt this a digital Congress to, to their uh, promotional model. But in all the challenges that we are fighting in the pharma companies, what is very clear is that we need to, uh, to, to, to sell the obligations to, to, to become flexible and agile and to have agility uh, because these are the big skills that people need to, to, to develop in the pharma companies to adapt to this new circumstance because nobody knows what would happen in the future. And this is my perspective about the current uh, challenge in the pharma companies. Thanks, Javier, and sorry uh, for my technical difficulties. Yeah, you, you answered exactly the question I want to ask. I would say one more aspect of this is, do you feel that there is an opportunity here 
I mean, is there in the long run, will we see actually, a, will there be a positive sort of aspect to this down the line? I think that's a big, uh, there is a big uh, real opportunity for the pharma companies because normally the pharma mm. companies in the communication uh, strategies that you see, they are always using a product communication strategies. They are always talking about the products, about the drugs. And I think that the, this new uh, promotional model uh, offered uh, with digital content need to adapt the communication with the needs of the doctors. And for that reason, we are changing the content that we are offering in this digital promotion. And for instance, we start to work with physicians about their skills. We are talking about them, about uh, some aspects of the pathologies. And we are starting to forget that we only need to talk about our products. And we start to use pull strategies. And this, I think that this is a good opportunity to offer value to our doctors. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Daniela, uh, I would say same question about COVID-19, about the challenges and also the opportunities there uh, in your case. Yes, so the biggest challenge uh, is uh, what you said, uh, Xavi, is that uh, now that there are no congresses to, to attend, to, to update the knowledge, um, how the doctors can access medical education. And the main challenge I see right now is uh, that um, if you had um, planned your Congress for the next month, um, the, the way you transform it uh, into the digital world is completely different. So basically you have to start from scratch because this is not the same uh, to be in the same room together and to have human contacts and networking opportunities than uh, being alone at home or in the practice and uh, in front of your computer or your smartphone with all the distraction and so on. So the main challenge is how do I engage physicians online uh, when uh, going together is not possible. So that's what um, we are trying to do in, in XPA. Like, how do we engage physicians? Well, there are many ways, of course. We can hold webinars like that and have discussion. It's perfect for that. But when it comes to training the physician on a certain topic, it's exactly as Xavier said. Like, you have to uh, not talk about uh, the product, but you have to bring really uh, value content with the best speakers in the world. And you have to um, make this content engaging. and most of the time uh, we discover that new techniques and innovation in the way we educate doctors are maybe simple like um, not having powerpoints trying to be uh, creative and have the the attention of your attendees um, it can be with the micro learning techniques that uh, we use for instance in our app XP because the attention span uh, online is very very low like um, people decide to see a video or a stream in the first 30 seconds so really you have to um, go online uh, with all the strategy and when I said at the beginning in my introduction it's all about back to basics and how we can innovate in the basic uh, principles of uh, online on training it's like that I mean how can I engage uh, doing things differently because Right now, the biggest challenge is that it's not only doing webinars and going streaming. It's not the way to do uh, things effectively. It's to build really a strategy because online you have to um, to define other types of strategy to reach your goals and your target. Thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, Magda, how are things changed? Uh, you know, for you, I know that you don't have access to the classrooms as much as you used to. This is, this is my classroom. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's uh, right here. Yeah, no, I I think I, I join what my my colleague said in terms of there are fantastic opportunities, but on the other side also some some uh, uh, challenges. So for a school that it says well, like yes, uh, no, we we say it's case study, you know, that we would say case study. You need to be presential. You need to have this experience of this what we call the transformational experience of uh, discussing with your peers and, and all the things that go around uh, 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 in, the, in the coffee breaks, et cetera, around the classroom, the meetings, et cetera, is part of the, of the learning experience, which joins your commentary on the, on the uh, 
in the conferences, no, this this interaction that goes actually is as important that goes in the breaks and the, particularly for pharmaceutical companies, no, and uh, no, to reach out to the keywords in the breaks and and discuss. So I think this networking and and presential interaction was was suddenly lost. And we had always said, no, no, case study cannot be be uh, online. You can move a talk online, but not case studies. And suddenly we had to do it. We had to move things online. So we 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 really worked hard on that and and thought into yeah, how can we actually use uh, 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 the the blackboard that we usually use on on the screen? It's better to have it white. It, it's seen better. Now we start actually also to use with uh, to use an iPad where where we can actually use the screen and then just just uh, just write out so that some of my colleagues have been been using that then we done a lot of sessions of training so train the train of training our faculty in order to use uh, to use on uh, um, um, online and we did a lot of learning in there that Harvard Business School did a whole series of webinars on um, on how to teach case studies in an in an online environment, and that then suddenly this challenge turns into an opportunity. Well, great! We we sit with great colleagues in the same classroom. We ask questions, and we actually learn much more than we would have learned if we were just have going on as uh, uh, as usual. Um, challenges definitely for some of my elder colleagues, but I I just to. Uh, uh, one one of the colleagues that has been very much involved in driving this is uh, Professor Sandra Sieber. She said, "I was so amazed that one of those those uh, 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 professors that are like the the uh, uh, have been been at Yeso for a long time and and." Uh, she would not have expected, but suddenly we're really enjoying it. We're doing a great job in an in an in an in an online uh, in in, uh, in environment. So I think that would be the thing. Well, it's it's uh, it's uh, good. No, it's it, this is really something that that uh, there's a huge learning and the, uh, something very very positive. But now for so this, I would say for the last months has been really good. Now we have been we we actually started to work on campus again. From from Monday on, we have a whole design of uh, safety instructions of students uh, going half the classes only going with uh, a lot of distances between them in the in the classroom. So the classes are hybrid. We teach one uh, the, the half of the students in the class, half of them out of the class. So that is also a great a, a, a great learning experience. But moving on, what is the next step? We really think that like comes comes autumn, we really think that. For for the new MBAs coming coming in, we, we need this being uh, being be, being present, this network, you know, that you refer to in 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 uh, in uh, conferences. So we actually have to find the best way how to go over these 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 uh, uh, crisis now and and see how can we actually manage until we can go more or less back to normal. I think there will be a new normal, so we will not be really go back to, to normal. But we would definitely take up some of these things for the for the for the um, for the for the future. We are still looking into how to adapt things like design thinking workshops. So there are some new tools and there's another opportunity. There are a lot of startups that are starting to say, well, let's see how we can do it. We can help you do it doing that. Also, people uh, that are uh, 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 consultant that that, that that know well. I know how to create an, an uh, on, online um, interactive and enthusiastic environment. The same that uh, Daniela, you you mentioned for uh, for doctors. How can we engage them? And they have been working with uh, distant teams uh, from a big pharma. Would be you have teams all, all all over five different continents, and you bring them together in an engaging way. So these people know how to do that. So we'll definitely we'll be using all of us will be using more how to do more engagement in the future. So a lot of learning, still a lot of challenges, but a lot of opportunities also in reaching out. I mentioned that earlier that we would be we just now I'm sitting on a working group with BAM, this business school alliance on uh, what well, let's design a few sessions that we that each of us each of the school is doing one and then we can share that with with the, with, with our students. So I would say we have both and I think it's about managing it well to make the best out of it. Thanks, Magda. Uh, you all touched on several themes. Um, you know, the, the idea that you have to be there specifically to learn. You have to be in the classroom. You have to be uh, in, you know, if we're talking about the physicians, for example, you have to train at the hospital, for example. All these things are have been sort of disrupted 
And uh, I want to sort of expand on the last part of my question. What excites you all the most about the innovations that are coming in the future? You know, what can we, uh, what, what, what is it that we can expect, uh, whether it be, uh, and what, what technologies can we expect to, uh, to um, I would say, roll out in the near future and maybe in more in the distant future, I would say. Uh, let's start with, I would say, let's start with Daniela this time. Um, for me, the biggest opportunity is giving access, universal access to the best mm -hmm. uh, knowledge. Because now we have mm -hmm. the means to do that. So um, even in Africa, they have a mobile phone and an internet connection. So um, this is a fantastic opportunity to make um, continuing medical education and and medical education for the students available all around the world. And it's not uh, just something that uh, would be nice to, to do, but very necessary because what is uh, completely a reality is that uh, right now we uh, miss many doctors and healthcare professionals. And we saw that with the COVID-19 crisis, but um, 10 years from now, we will uh, miss millions of healthcare professionals uh, to uh, take care of us around the world. So we really have have to innovate in the way we deliver uh, medical education to make it more effective, more quicker uh, and easier to have uh, to be able to face uh, the global uh, health uh, outcomes. Brilliant. Uh, Javier? It's happening not only in the three in the, in the last three months, it's regarding uh, that the scientific content or, or the medical content in that is available in the digital channels are increasing very fast. Uh, there are a lot of data that say that maybe in two or three years we will have the double of con scientific content available in, 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 in digital channels. Then uh, there, there are a, a big gap between the uh, scientific content available and the capability of the human to uh, study all the uh, scientific content that are available. For that reason, we need uh, companies who uh, uh, take the opportunity to help physicians, for instance, on the health authorities, to find the, the innovative uh, and needed content uh, to take the best decisions. For that reason, we need someone who develop uh, content accurate uh, strategies to uh, facilitate physicians to reach the real content that they need to take the best decisions to treat patients. And this is, I think this is one of the big opportunities. And we saw in the last three months that uh, if, we can sh if we share our, uh, our experience or our uh, content with the rest of companies, we can uh, achieve whatever we want. Can I, can I ask you, Javier, speaking, speaking of this, how do you prevent something like digital overload of happening with, with physicians, given that yeah. I imagine uh, all pharmaceutical the, companies the, are going to This is the thing. real big challenge. This is the real big challenge for, because, for instance, in the last uh, two months, more than uh, 20 companies has started with a remote medical visit. Then, as you can imagine, the, our doctors are completely full. Uh, they have an agenda completely full because in the in some specialties, the doctors uh, has stopped their consultancy. Then now they are starting another time with the consultancies and they have a lot of big use of patients. And there are a lot of companies who are trying to reach them with these remote visits. And then this overload of, act of digital activities is a big problem for physicians. And what is the real solution? The real solution is to do a, a, a right segmentation of our uh, customers, of our doctors. We need to know what is the real interest of our doctors and offering them in the best channels or in the time that they can uh, stay with us. Then for that reason, it's very important not to give uh, digital contents to everybody, but also to uh, target uh, our physicians in the digital preference and especially in the real needs that they have to offer the real content that they need. And this is, I think this is the real challenge for the pharma companies not to overload uh, the doctor's uh, time. 
Thanks, Javier. Magda, I know you work with many startups, with many projects, uh, and you've, you're, you, you're seeing a lot of these innovation, innovative product, projects sort of coming to fruition uh, and uh, being accelerated, especially now with COVID, uh, during the time of COVID-19. So I'd, you know, I'd love to hear some something you're excited about uh, yeah. in, in this well, I had some on, uh, issues on, on the other question that you had in terms of the change. Mm -hmm. The, the second yeah. point, I think, maybe if I might be, if I could start with that, is I like the, what uh, Chevy said about the knowledge, the change of knowledge. Like suddenly we have very quick knowledge and there's a lot of, well, there's not the usual check. So what is really is true or what is not true? We have these preprints floating around. So how reliable is that? We want to know more and quicker about COVID, but we are we are we are but jumping the usual things that will also in the in the innovation now and in, in finding a vaccine and finding treatment. No, so that that's a. Uh, is a it maybe a dis or at least a question mark. But on the other side, we have seen that fantastic developments, uh, innovation developments have happened because people just took things in their own hands. They said, "We need, we need another, uh, 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 um, um, we need another machine." So we we just use uh, 3D printing and and we uh, do it ourselves. So these. These, uh, I'd love to keep some of this spirit of just saying, well, we have a problem, let's just do it. And that's what we actually try. We have been trying to teach doctors. Now they have really, really done it. There are so many creative solutions. How can we keep that on? Can we can we learn from how to do that? And can we teach that how to be uh, responsible and changing things that do not work and not waiting that all oh, the system will change it? I think so that's, an, that's an, uh, 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 a very um, um, uh, important point. Other things that we change access, I think Daniela has has, uh, has mentioned that. But there's another thing in terms of access also, and here maybe that c comes to your question, is this collaboration that we have as academic institutions in our learning environment with the companies, know that we really actively work uh, uh, together. And usually you had to reach out, now I had for my health management course, I would fly someone in from Basel to, to, to speak with the students. Well, now I can say, well, you know what? We just just do it uh, we just do it online so I think a lot more collaboration will be there in the in the future and that will definitely be also the the, the case for uh, for the for the startups know that they can much better access to the advice that is really needed all, all over the world they don't have to travel uh, but they can just uh, through the network and there are a lot of different good networks there they can access the advice that they that they um, that they need so I'm sure that we will see some very interesting changes there. Thank you, Magda. Um, so I think um, I think just just following on what you said, Magda, um, what do you think? What do you think is the university's role here? I would say in in supporting this, maybe to maybe maybe a separate question. If we think about how traditionally medical doctors have been trained, do you think they should be trained on different things now? Given that we're entering yeah. this sort of digital world, yeah, that's a very that's a, that's a that's a very good uh, uh, question. So probably starting with the role of uh, universities. Usually, classically, this is uh, the place for research and, and innovation. Many things that we see see out and see out there now being sold by private companies or by the big companies have actually been developed in uh, um, university. And I must say, particularly Europe here with the uh, European uh, Research Program has done a great job on on supporting uh, universities in doing that. And as they there, they will actually look into the tech transfer. They will look into the um, creating uh, uh, startup companies themselves, helping them with the the IP and 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 with with other things. So I think this role of universities of bringing new things, new discoveries out in the real world and applying it so that it reaches the patients uh, uh, or wh wh wherever they can make make impact. I think that's a very important 
role of uh, of uh, uni universities no and here um also the collaboration with the with the industry that i mentioned i just was evaluating erasmus mundi project by the european uh, commission and there are one very important point so erasmus mundi is collaboration with different universities uh, um, uh, across the globe the the it's mandatory then to reach out and work with universities to make this uh, a practical so that i think it's an important role of universities of staying close no to the to the uh, uh, to the to the real world and make what they teach really uh, relevant um the role in medical studies, so we, I have been working with different medical schools uh, across Europe on saying, well, what is the future of uh, medical teaching? And I know that there's a lot of other people looking into what should be the medical and clinical curriculum. I mean, I'm a doctor, but that's not my, my expertise on that part, on the clinical part, where it's probably looking into how we want to do more practical things. That's like the general tonos on the clinical part. And here, uh, uh, so now to do more simulation, to more, more practical thing and do the knowledge base the, the information we said that is so big we cannot and when I learned medical studies you needed to lo learn so much by heart you still have to do that a bit but it's like really moving into the practical thing so there's a lot of thinking now on what how should the future medical studies being being uh, be, be looking like but our role was then is like how to bring exactly your questions here how do we bring um, um entrepreneurship how do we bring creativity how do we bring this multidisciplinarity into the into the studies and at least into the master programs and here eit health has been put on the way for several master programs that are actually uh, bringing in a multidisciplinary in, in a multidisciplinary way together the, the bioengineers the doctors the the uh, uh, even the economists, the, the artists, and uh, that, that's a great way, I think, to move on. And, and I'm sure that the role of universities will be that of fostering multidisciplinary work uh, very, very, uh, very early on. Thanks, Magda. Uh, sorry, I would, I, would yeah. like to, I would like to add something to Magda. Uh, I completely yeah. agree with everything that you say, but I think that you have two potential benefits that the, the the health industry can uh, take profit from the university. The first, that you have the credibility to put all the stakeholders together to share our experience and to try to solve uh, the problems all together. And you have the credibility to do it. And the second big benefit that that could offer the university to the pharma, uh, to the to the medical uh, societies or to, to them or to the health industry is the open innovation. Uh, you have yes. the opportunity to learn from other industries. I think that uh, the, the, the normally the health industries is very close and we are always yes. the same. And we need to see other industries to learn from other industries because the most of technologies that we can use in the health uh, to, to help uh, patients that are developing in other industries then yeah. uh, I think that you have a, a big a, a important role uh, to develop innovation taking other innovation uh, from other company or from other industries and to bring to the health industry it's a very good you make this point I mean I've been working with the with EMI the innovative medicine initiative that was pharma driven like F FPA driven all the big farmers got together to work that so the European Commission pays the part of academics of universities. And then they really realize and say, well, we need other other industries here. So we need to for, of big data. So we need the the, the uh, IT uh, IT companies here. So the, we have really realized that we only can drive innovation uh, by bringing uh, in industries together. And you're right that the 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 um, university as like a neutral ground, a neutral platform can create actually that space where where we can uh, discuss without being from one pharma company or the or the other. We just had a meeting with our new health alumni chapter, the alumni health chapter by Yesse, where we have a lot of different pharma companies together, and they say, well, between these alumni, we can we can uh, we can really realize to have a better better exchange. So here also there's an continuous uh, uh, um, role of universities with their alumni to, to, to actually really drive change, uh, bringing, bringing people together. So I very much agree. Thanks for making that point. 
Thank you both. Um, I have a question, uh, sort of a follow-up question uh, for Daniela. Um, you touched on conferences. Um, I imagine that virtual reality in the future, virtual reality technology might replace this need and might create opportunities for networking, you know, in this virtual space. Uh, so, you know, in, in this sense, uh, I'm, I'm curious, um, what is your vision for, for the future, you know, in terms of, you know, physician education in, in general? I think that's the major learning of COVID-19 is that um, uh, we can maintain contact and network uh, despite the fact that we can be face to face and this will last. I'm sure about that because uh, for not only for the COVID-19 situation, but also for the environment. I mean, it's clear now that we can do things differently. So really when we will meet, because we will meet again, of course, it will be really for a necessary meeting. So um, really uh, we have to find the way to uh, um, generate networking opportunities and community online and it's uh, the major challenge right now because it's not only uh, being in the same room, is having the room in our programs to let people interact and have the discussion to express themselves. So, for instance, one of the topics uh, the my my two colleagues uh, uh, talked about is about cooperation and the role of the doctors and the medical education providers is also key to collaborate between um, each other and to make the knowledge available online and um, structuring it because we speak about uh, scientific knowledge so um, everything must be professional ethic um, evidence-based so when I see doctors that are uh, telling things on YouTube, for instance, I say, no, we have new means to do things professionally. And um, for instance, uh, in XP, we want to build this kind of community, making um, the doctor, um, the, the, the giving him the opportunity to uh, put the knowledge, his knowledge out there and not just um, being the key opinion leader uh, in the conference, you know, but sharing knowledge all together uh, to uh, make the, the knowledge in accessible anytime, anywhere, and quicker. Because uh, Congress is once a year. Now we have the good opportunity to, to make it every month, every week, every day. So that's the biggest opportunity. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit now about um, sort of the barriers to entry. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about different types of innovation, a lot of focus on on content and delivering content all the time. It, we're talking about a very traditional industry as well. And uh, I wonder what are the barriers to entry on one hand, and then on the other hand, what are the types of partnerships that we need to roll out these innovations in the future? Uh, Magda, maybe we'll start with you this time. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, I mean, we have been uh, over the last years already uh, seeing a lot of uh, 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 different um, online uh, uh, teaching uh, ways, no, but a lot of uh, different, uh, di different platforms. And uh, we, as, as I said earlier, we already said for case study, it needs to be presential, etc. So I think that there there will be a change. The barriers to entry, and I, I, I take what uh, Daniela just said, no, it's like, is really, if we can see that like, this is a high level content that we have here. And for YESO, other universities, is the place where uh, a research is done. I mean, our insights into management is because we do a lot of uh, research, and that would be similar of universities, uh, of a medical faculty, for, for, uh, uh, for example, and of a, um, of a QL. So I would say barriers to interest, it will stay excellent. Now, will we always be able to really show that, that this is better than another? Probably the name will, will uh, uh, play a, a role. So institutions that we uh, uh, we know that have been uh, uh, delivered, and like the name of Harvard, no, it's usually have a different price tag than uh, another other uh, 
other business schools. So, the, but I think this is something that we have to continue to prove, and there might be different ways how we how we um, how we do that. But all of us have started to do online online teaching, and it's an it's a it's a new market. So we don't really know how will that uh, uh, develop. I would say we will we will keep on doing things uh, 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 presential. But I would say probably most of these uh, uh, things will be in a in a in a hybrid way. And here, probably in terms of barriers to entry, is definitely also the location. Well, the location, the um, installation, or no? the uh, facilities that you have, also the type of uh, 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 programs that you use. I know here Barcelona Health have used a fantastic tool, no, to to facilitate these uh, 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 these uh, these series that works very well. We have been looking into that. So I think the access to good uh, technology tool will be a barrier to entry. And then even so, the very important point is this access that we democratize, that we have geographical access and also well, the access to good education for lower income because the price will be lower, um, will be um, also the, the access to uh, 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 technology in terms of broadband uh, um, um, Etc. So that would be my kind of on a um, my points on what are the barriers to uh, entry. Um, and I mean, Magda, you've been in many different uh, partnerships as well with various. I mean, you're you work in. I mean, you work with various companies within different consortiums as well. I mean, there must definitely be a need for interdisciplinary and uh, inter-industry sort of uh, relationships and collaborations within education, this space specifically, right? To, to roll out innovation simply for, for example, for uh, teaching how doctors have to do, for example, over augmented reality or things like that. How, how do you roll out innovation? Uh, I mean, within a very regulated market, right? In this sense. And I have the same question for, also for Daniela, just because you have, um, Within you know within your startup specifically, what are the barriers that you've seen, and uh, what are the collaborations that you need as well? So maybe well, so then Daniela, yeah. Well, let's it start with the question: Who is the who is the QL? No, who who, yeah. who is actually? If, if I do, we have a project now. We do one on, with virtual reality for rehabilitation of stroke. We work with right. the uh, uh, Asil des Aveugles in uh, in uh, um, Lausanne and also the. Uh, University of Aachen in in Germany. So um, we the 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 guy he's a genius. No, that that actually put this this virtual the virtual reality and then they also use neuro, neuro stimulation. So it's a very interesting project. But when we ask, look, why don't you give us a list of QLs that we can ask that might be used this that he. he that well, the people I know are people. They are they are they are tech freaks. No, they're, these are people that they they are engineers and they work on that part. So I think the role in in be it education or support you asked this earlier to to start up is that we can also help to make meet these uh, 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 more technical and science with those that do do implement and uh, we are helping here to do needs assessment so we go out and look into the ask the stroke rehabilitators like how will you be using this this uh, this device in the in the in the uh, um, in the future we have our students in the summer job will actually help us do that and they they love they love to go out in the in the in the in the real world to to actually get the um, um, experience there. So I think the, the education definitely there's a there's a big big role in bringing people together and bringing different uh, um, uh, different universities together. We have been working with KTH in in in, in Stockholm, which is the Royal Institute of Te Technology, and I worked a lot with the vice president, and he's an he's the guy he's an expert in uh, earthquakes. And I, I must say, I learned so much from him. And then he asked me now to join in a project they do, where there is also a look into prevention. No, that is the whole thing that we look into our preparedness. No, in terms of of COVID, how can we do this in earthquakes? So there's a lot of uh, parallels there. So I love to be part of that project. Or for, for the moment, it's a proposal preparation because I know there's so much that I can learn and take back to to the to the classroom for my for my students. So maybe I stop here. We have many other projects, but these. Yeah. I mean, I'm, 
I would say I would be motivated by joining a project because of the the amount of learning I will I will get out of it. That Daniela what collaborations yes. that that you need. <laughs> yeah. So for me, um, what you have to take into account is of course the regulation and also the ethics. Uh, these play a huge role in the sector. So uh, for that, uh, you have to uh, have experience uh, in the sector or have someone that has uh, the experience. But um, we find that, uh, and Barcelona Health Hub is a, is a great example of that, uh, when you mix people, when you mix uh, and these uh, doctors with PhDs, uh, researchers, uh, with ITs, uh, with technology, and with also uh, the latest trends in regulations, policies, data, ethics, uh, all of that, it's when really you get the old picture. So um, I would strongly recommend that uh, when you do uh, this kind of, um, when you want really to innovate in healthcare education, talk to all the stakeholders, and there are many. I can count them because you have to count with the universities, the medical societies, and I mean, lots of stakeholders, but that's how you will have the, the whole picture. Javier, what about pharma and medical device? What role do they play? Uh, in, in the case of pharma companies, uh, there are a lot of uh, programs that they are collaborating with other external stakeholders because the pharma companies has the market but they don't have the capability to innovate. For that reason, when they have a challenge, they go to the market to find uh, startups, for instance, to find the technologies that could help to solve that problems. And that's very, very uh, typical in the pharma companies that we are opening our challenge to external companies because they have the innovatives. As we are arriving to the singularity moment, then, uh, it's, it's, it's it clear that the, there are technologies around the world that can help us to the to the health companies uh, to solve the current problems. The only thing that we need is to search these technologies and to incorporate it and to readapt to our real needs. For that reason, the collaborative innova innovation is real necessary in our uh, sector. Thank you. Um, so I have one question from the audience, uh, and it's relevant. We were talking a lot about, um, you know, physician education, but uh, you know, and sort of in the patient empowerment. Uh, we our question is, uh, what is your experience in relation to patient health education? Do you think that it's something is that will be changing uh, in the future? Uh, maybe. maybe uh, whoever, I, I, I have. have a, maybe, I have a yeah. lot. I have a, lot, a long experience in education of patients. Uh, there are a lot of clinical trials that show that if we empower the patient, they can use efficiently the, the, the medical resources that, that are available. And there are a lot of companies or a lot, a lot of patients associations that are doing a lot of educational programs. And uh, I think that uh, any experience that are successful with doctors we can bring to the patients because the patients are the most interested in having the maximum information about their, pat their pathologies then uh, is everything that we think about educational for physicians we need to think also uh, education for patients because the patients has the key uh, to solve and to manage their own uh, pathologies Right. Yeah, then, we have, we have been, Magda, go ahead. Sorry, Magda. Yeah, no, just uh, so we have been involved in the project with co creation with patients, and this is uh, fantastic. So they're very active, and I agree. I mean, that this is something that should be done much more of involving them, no, uh, on, on, on what is the best way that they see. We are also involved in a project that is for, for patient led innovation, and here these are real startups that come out of ideas by patients. So it's a, uh, uh, um, Portuguese uh, Danish collaboration, but uh, so we do we, we will do a boot, a boot camp for uh, uh, patients uh, for patient led innovation, and I think we should do more more of uh, of, of that. This is this needs led that really make things that are relevant for for uh, for patient and here closer collaboration no, with patients and with uh, um, physicians and healthcare professionals, and that's probably also what you do, uh, Daniela. 
Yes, for me the key is that the doctor and the healthcare professional are the key to train efficiency, the patient. And yes, the patient has uh, the biggest role uh, in his treatment, uh, in uh, his pathology. And um, the most important uh, challenge for the future is prevention. And prevention will only occur if the patient is in charge of his or her health. And uh, how can we do that? Well, we have first to train the healthcare professionals and all the healthcare system has to uh, put a system in place on uh, educating the, the patients, the citizen, um, on how to manage his or her health. And um, for me, the, the perfect link uh, between the patients and the need for the society to change, uh, um, to, to go for prevention society, is the doctor. And uh, for instance, uh, I dedicated myself for a full year speaking of, uh, with doctors all around the world. And when I say what is the biggest challenge right now is empathy. It seems uh, like, wow, uh, okay, just that. No, it's very important. And uh, there are lots of studies that uh, show that if you teach a doctor how to be empathetic with the patient, well, uh, it increases its compliance to treatment, its trust, et cetera, et cetera. So really, uh, there are a lot of uh, things to do there. Please innovate there. Yes. I completely agree because I completely agree because I'm sure that the role of physicians is going to change a lot in the future. The machine learning is going to give solutions to the health system that the currently the physician cannot give. There are a lot of clinical trials that are uh, supporting that the, intel the artificial intelligence take better decisions than doctors. Then, what would be the, the real role that the physicians will have in the future? The real role is a coach, a coach of the patient. And then they need to, to, to develop these skills to manage and to, and to go with the patients, uh, taking the best decisions. And I absolutely agree with the empathy as one of the skills that we need to teach, for instance, in the university. Yes, yes, correct, correct. We're, we're, we're trying to do that. That's exactly, I, I, I very much agree on that. We are, clo we are closing the circle. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, I, absolutely agree. <laughs> no, I think that that's an incredible note to end this, uh, this with. Uh, I'd like to thank you for attending the uh, Barcelona Health Hub uh, and the discussion of this invitation. And um, so the next week session will be happening the next session will be happening on june 1st uh if you've been following these um religiously uh thank you to the speakers uh, i believe we're going to be staying for a little while just to pick uh but uh but this was wonderful thank you so much uh, for for joining us today uh, for this conversation thank you thanks for thank organizing it and uh, it was great thank it was you great. <laughs> thank you thank what you. a pleasure